would like to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, thank Agilent Technologies who have been supporting this, uh, this uh, engineering science uh, lecture series since the start. Uh, and uh, uh, on behalf of the uh, School of Science and Technology and the uh, Engineering Science Department, uh, I uh, welcome you all uh, to this, uh, uh, it's number six lecture since the beginning of the semester. Uh, okay, before I, sp I uh, introduce our speaker for, t for today, let me mention that uh, uh, on the 2nd of, of February, uh, that's the next talk, uh, beginning of the, of the next semester, we have Dr. Uh, Raul Singh, Associate Professor, Department of Computer Science in San Francisco State University, and the title of his talk is uh, Drug Discovery Against Neglected uh, Tropical Diseases, a Computer Science Perspective. Uh, for uh, the, the uh, invited speaker for today is Dr. Uh, uh, Joseph uh, uh, Bergland. Uh, and the title of his talk is uh, Medical Device Product Design, Developing Today's Technologies to Address Tomorrow's Challenges. Dr. Joseph Bergland uh, is an R&D Product Development Manager in Medtronic's Cardiovascular B Business Unit. Is responsible for early phase projects and opportunity assessments, including uh, bioabsorb uh, bioabsorbable and next generation drug looting extent programs. Some of these projects aim to uh, diversify the product portfolio, while others incorporate novel technologies into current device offerings. Prior to Medtronic, uh, Joe conducted a postdoctoral research rotation at uh, Emory University a School of Medicine, Atlanta, Georgia, where he studied the response of vasc vascular cell in the uh, presence of uh, normal and distributed flow conditions. Joe received his Bachelor of Science in Biomedical Engineering with uh, a material science uh, concentration from John Hopkins University uh, in 1996, uh, and uh, his PhD in bioengineering at Georgia Institute of Technology in 2002. Currently, Joe is uh, pursuing an MBA from Wharton School of uh, Business at, the, uh, uh, at their San Francisco campus. Joe lives in uh, Santa Rosa, California, uh, with his wife and two daughters. He enjoys bicycle riding in his spare time. So here is right. Dr. Beckler. Thank you for the kind of <laughs> If I knew you would have read it, I would have written something more interesting on there. So, <laughs> uh, do I need to switch to talk oh, to yeah. uh, So before I, I get started, I'm gonna have uh, three disclaimers. Uh, the first is a lot of what we're gonna be talking about since this is a very regulated industry, refers to technologies that haven't really been uh, commercialized within the U.S. So it's not, so, uh, we're supposed to indicate that it's not an endorsement or pre-promotion of things. So if anyone is with the FDA, you know, you can raise your hand and, you know, feel safe that that's there. Uh, the, the second is that uh, a lot of these slides are put together from our marketing group. So uh, if they have flowery words and other sorts of things on there, you know, just kind of bear with it. And then the third is I'm going to present a lot from the Medtronic perspective because that's uh, what I know, but this is really, you know, able to be generalized throughout all of medical devices. So to start, uh, you know, who here feels like they know what a medical device is? Just kind of by show of hands. So then that kind of sets the stage. Uh, <laughs> so uh, basically these are instruments or implants, and they, they're defined as anything that would diagnose, treat, or prevent diseases and conditions. And they're uh, really kind of separated from other things because they're uh, regulated by the FDA. And they fall under three basic classes. So the class one is very common. It's you know, anything from a tongue depressor to a latex examination glove. Uh, class two is you know, a little bit higher risk in terms of how it interacts with the potential patient. So x-ray instruments, IV pumps. So if something goes wrong with them, there's probably you know, some complications, but it's probably not life-threatening. And what most people think about are, are these class three devices, and that's really where Medtronic spends most of their time. Uh, but implantable heart valves or pacemakers or artificial hips, 
where if you know something goes wrong with that or, or there's an infection or something, you know, it, it's really life life threatening. Uh, so. Uh, the history of where our company came from, and really ours was the, the first uh, medical device company, started back in, in 1957. And back then, Medtronic was uh, working out of a garage to basically repair medical equipment. So they would, you know, something would break in the hospital and they would send it out and they, you know, would be electricians that would go and solder back the wires that had come loose. Uh, but Dr. Lilyhigh had a, a good partnership with uh, the founder, uh, Earl Bakken, and, you know, during one of the power outages, uh, the pacemakers that kept the pediatric uh, patients alive uh, went off and several children died and they you know started thinking that based on the technology of the day back in 1957 that this really isn't something that should happen so you know he was a, a tinkerer looked at you know popular electronics maybe you know some people who like kind of engineering and things like that kind of can you know relate to that but looked at you know transistors and metronomes and kind of worked together to put a circuit together so you can see uh, the, the first pacemaker, the first wearable pacemaker, really is a pretty kludgy sort of, you know, thing. It was, you know, basically, you know, screwed together out of, out of a popular electronics book. But this really, you know, set the stage, and eventually these became implantable and, you know, kind of launched the whole industry of where we are today. Uh, so while I am in uh, Santa Rosa, we focus on uh, cardiovascular stents, so basically things that will try to open up blood vessels. But what I would really like to share today is kind of the breadth of all the different possibilities of medical devices. And Medtronic originally and still probably today is known largely as a cardiac rhythm management company. Uh, they have what's known as implantable cardiac defibrillators or ICDs. So these are one of the, you know, the largest you know, uh, drivers of our revenues. Uh, but basically they're implantable uh, sorts of uh, devices that if your heart stops, will shock you, so instead of an external defibrillator, they will provide an internal signal that will then get your heart started. And you can see that, you know, with a normal heart rhythm uh, method, there's different sorts of, you know, arrhythmias or different, you know, anomalies to that. So you could have brachycardia, where your heart beats too slowly, or tachycardia, where your heart beats very quickly, or, the, you know, the worst is when it goes into ventral fibrillation, where it beats so fast that it can't even beat, or it can't even pump the blood, and that's where you need to shock to get back into to normal uh, sinus rhythm. Uh, so you can see that you know from the 1980s till today, uh, it used to be that you know the devices were these abdominal implants. They were pretty large and kludgy. You know it was it's still unpleasant to get a shock, but back then it was you know definitely very unpleasant. And they had about a lifetime of a, a year and a half. And you can see that you know just the, the technology and driving miniaturization today. You know, it's, it's a very minimally invasive procedure, subcutaneous. Uh, they, they can be programmed to give a, a range of different therapies. Uh, the batteries today last up to nine years, and those are non-rechargeable. If you think of, you know, your cell phone, you know, how long does the battery last on there and how, you know, how uh, reproducible it is. These, these are probably, you know, one of the highest technologies uh, that we have and one of the best batteries in the industry. So, you know, NASA and medical device companies probably have the, the you know, cutting edge in terms of battery technology. Yeah, what, what kind of technology is used for the battery? So right now it's uh, still a lithium based. Uh, they're, they're looking at different sorts of uh, materials and since it isn't really my department and mm -hmm. you know, I, I can't, well, even if I do, I probably couldn't go into it, but it, it's, uh, we, we are looking at a lot of different sorts of, of ways, including you know, some of those micro charging ones. You, know, you yeah. can think of you know, as the movement, you get the trickle charge. The problem there is you know, the amount of energy needed to do this it just isn't enough with the current uh, sort of uh, technologies. Mm -hmm. What has gained more traction is some of the rechargeable, where you would go in and wear a vest for you know six hours while you slept one day a month or something, or one day every six months. The challenge there is patient compliance isn't always exactly what you'd like. So, you know, the risk of having something where the patient does, you know, it, it's safer just to say the battery will run out in the normal lifespan. So. Okay. Uh, so just a, you know, a few facts about Medtronic, and this will be the end of my commercial, but you know, we have uh, 43,000 patients, so I'm trying to, or 43,000 employees. So if you think of you know, how many people you have on Facebook, you know, that's a lot of people to kind of know. So I, don't, I definitely can't represent all of the different uh, people and all the different activities equally across Medtronic, but hopefully I'll give you kind of a, a good flavor of that. Uh, more and more of our sales are uh, becoming from international markets. So right now we're in 120 countries. Uh, and you can see that this is a very technically focused uh, company. So 9,000 scientists and engineers 
uh, with 2,100 uh, or 21,000 patents. And patents have really, you know, been the, the key competitive advantage that companies, you know, basically will produce something and then sue each other and then hold it up in courts for many years and then someone gets $500 million at the end of the day. So it's, you know, large stakes, you know, a lot of money spent on technology, almost as much on lawyers. Uh, and then, you know, we're really trying to, you know, go from what used to be this cardiac rhythm management and, you know, different pacing abnormalities uh, to a very large uh, spectrum. Uh, so CRDM was that the pacing industry, the cardiovascular uh, group is the one that I'm in and I'll, I'll talk more about that later. Uh, physio control is uh, up in uh, Washington and just today we announced that we had divested it. Uh, but this is one that had external defibrillators. So if you walk through an airport or through you know, different schools and you see life pack on the walls, that's, that would be the Medtronic product. Uh, Medtronic is kind of interesting in that it's not really a name brand because you know, physicians know a lot about it, but it's, it's not something that you hear like Apple or Cisco <laughs> or some of these other you know, companies that uh, have, have more higher publicity. Uh, Spinal and Biologics is based out of uh, Memphis and we had a, a facility in, in Sunnyvale. Uh, neuromodulation looks to treat different pains and uh, chronic pains and other sorts of abnormalities. We have a group that looks at diabetes and then surgical technology is kind of our, our catch-all. It used to be a lot of, of the ENT type activities, but uh, you know, throughout the presentation, I'll kind of give some examples of different products from each of those. Uh, excuse me. Yes. For the neuromodulation you had, mm -hmm. something there. Uh, what do you mean by neuromodulation? So what, what happened was they, the, with the pacing technology, they realized that not only does the heart uh, conduct a lot of its you know, signals and regulation based off of electrical uh, conduction, but there's a lot of other places within the body. So if you think of ep epilepsy or some uh, chronic you know, sciatica or things like that, a lot of those deal with nerves and electrical uh, signals. So neuromodulation is a group that kind of formed out of that uh, that first looked at you know stimulating uh, regions in the brain to help epileptic patients. Uh, now they have both uh, localized drug delivery devices and uh, a lot of so their their big challenge is there's a lot of different possible diseases that could be treated and how do you uh, try to target which are the right ones to do. Uh, and you can see that you know of all the different types of things that we're doing, we're trying to go head to toe. I don't think we have something quite for the toe yet. Uh, but if you guys have ideas, we're, we're looking to fill this chart out a little bit more. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of you know, major chronic type conditions uh, that, that we're focusing. And really the, the key link, and this is probably true with all medical device companies, one of the things that's enjoyable is that it, you, know, you, you feel like you're helping patients, you're doing good for society. But we're really you know, trying to alleviate pain, restore health, and extend life. So you know, chronic conditions, uh, not necessarily always trying to cure the disease, uh, but trying to you know make make the conditions more available for the for the patients. Uh, so I'll, I'll give a little bit of background about uh, cardiology and interventional cardiology, which is uh, what what our group uh, works on. So the first uh, cardiac catheterization took place back in 1929, and this uh, Warner Forsman guy was a, a uro urologist who had this crazy idea that you could put a balloon catheter into the heart. And back then they thought that you know there were too many complications, and if you did that, you know, you, you would certainly, you know, have very serious outcomes. Nothing good would come of it, and he decided that he would show the world by doing it to himself, so he waited one night till everyone had left the hospital and, you know, took the catheterization, put it into his own heart, took the x-ray picture. He went back the next day, showed his boss that it could be done, and his boss fired him, and he never practiced medicine again. Uh, but m many decades later, he ended up winning the Nobel Prize uh, in medicine for this contribution. So I guess, you know, there's different ways uh, to fame. Uh, so, but th this kind of set off, you know, part of, you know, the, the first concept of being able to put a balloon in the heart. Back then, he didn't, he just did it because it could be done. The, probably the better example was Andreas Grunson in 1977, where he actually intentionally did it to try to reopen a, a clogged blood vessel. So he actually had a, you know, a purpose for that, performing the first uh, coronary angioplasty. So if you think of how invasive it is to do an open chest surgery where you have to crack the ribs, you know, uh, you have to, you know, many days of recovery to uh, recover from it, even if the procedure is very successful, there's lots of pain and trauma uh, compared to having a small hole placed in one of your blood vessels uh, to do the procedure. So you can see over time, you know, bypass surgery has definitely died off in favor of balloon angioplasty. 
And then every about you know, 15 years or so, we, we would talk that our, our customers are very fickle people and you know, that they like to adopt things very quickly. But balloon angioplasty gave way to bare metal stents, which then gave way to drug eluting stents. And kind of the question for the last you know, five to 10 years has been, well, what, what comes next? And you know, maybe at the end of the, the presentation, I'll share exactly what we think what comes next. But that, I, I think the verdict is still out for that. So for the rest of the talk, I'd like to talk about uh, six factors that I see as you know, very you know, influential and in, in driving where the industry is headed. Uh, the first being miniaturization, the second being combination devices. And by combination devices, I mean combining a pharmaceutical or a biologic with a traditional device. Uh, the third being communication and networking with you know, a lot of the uh, telemetry and other sorts of capabilities that the cell phone industry has brought. There's, there's more and more capabilities with, with that. And then other drivers that are, are less technically based are you know, the, the drive for lower cost and high reliability, the ever increasing regulatory environment, and then lastly, globalization. So if you think of uh, miniaturization, uh, just from uh, 1989 to today, so that's you know, roughly, uh, I can't do math, 30, carry the one, 30 years, you can see that, you know, that the size of these uh, pacemakers has reduced about 83% in size. And this is always going to be a driver. So even, you know, you think 36 cubic centimeters is pretty small, you know, that there's going to continually be a, a drive for, for smaller and smaller. And this is you know, true not only with you know, ICDs, but also in terms of uh, the you know, other sorts of aspects too. So if you think of the coronary interventions, you know, the reason why people don't want to do this large invasive open chest procedure, you could do laparoscopic, but minimally invasive uh, balloon angioplasty is even less invasive. So uh, you know, the, the benefits are that it's you know, lower risk than surgery. Uh, the, the challenges are when you open up the, the balloon, and does everyone know what, what I mean by balloon angioplasty? So basically, you, you know, you, you put the, a balloon at the end of a long polymer stick in, into the, the coronaries where the blockages are, and then you inflate it to 9 to 20 atmospheres of pressure, which then forces the clot to be pushed against uh, the wall of the, the artery. Uh, so that worked relatively well, except when you stretch out something that has grown shut over a long period of time, you create a lot of damage, and then afterwards, you, you, know, you create a, a wound formation, which is known as restenosis. So tissue that recloses off, kind of like a scar tissue, is known as restenosis, whereas you know, flaps or other sorts of you know, tissue that doesn't quite get pressed against the wall is known as dissections in the emboli. So the way that they fix that is uh, with uh, stents. So stents are like a small ca metal cage, and you know, that, instead of just opening up the blood vessel, you open it up and then leave this scaffolding behind. And that was very effective in, in reducing this acute closure of, of the blood vessel. And you can see that over time, uh, the size of the struts, so this is the cross-section uh, of the struts, has gotten smaller and smaller. So from 1997, it's hard to see, over to 2003, uh, you, you can see an area there, there is approximately a, a five-fold decrease in size. And this is, you know, kind of again towards that miniaturization sort of example that both, you know, new designs, new materials, uh, kind of, you know, other sorts of technologies, but everything, you know, trying to force things to get smaller and smaller because, you know, there, there's only so much real estate that you can have and you want to do as, as much good as you can in a compact area. Uh, the way that we make our stents is actually a little bit interesting as well. So I you know, have a, a slide uh, on that. So most uh, companies take a, a hypo tube, so basically like a needle, and they will laser cut out a jigsaw cut pattern of the different designs. So if you want to have different sort of patterns, you just cut out different uh, sorts of patterns. The way that we have done is we've started with a single ring, and we've stamped it into uh, this uh, sinusoid, and then by lining them up, and laser fusing them together will create uh, what uh, is, the, is the stent scaffold. So a longer stent would have more of these rings. And you would say, well, you know, why would you go about doing that? It's you know, much more complicated and you, you end up you know, a, a much more complex manufacturing process. And the reason is if you think of the rigid tube and trying to bend it as you go through this very tortuous anatomy, you still have a lot of the remnants of, of that solid tube. Whereas these flexible segments are almost like a snake and allow the, uh, a lot more flexibility and deliverability. And that's one of their big challenges is to get to the location that you want to treat. How uh, long are these uh, stents? 
So they can be anywhere. The shortest is usually about eight millimeters, the longest being 36 millimeters. Uh, it's not uncommon to put multiple stents, so some patients get five stents at a time. You, you have you know, three large vessels in your coronaries, uh, but you know, some of these, you know, depending on where the curvature and bifurcations are, you end up having uh, arteries that either need to have multiple small stents. Sometimes you'd like to have one long stent, you just can't get it there because the longer it is, the harder it is to flex. And, and are they collapsed and then when they go there, they open or what? Yeah, so I wish I, I had brought one, uh, but basically they're, they're uh, what's called crimped onto the balloon. So basically squeeze down onto this balloon that's on the, the long stick. And then when you inflate the balloon, that's when you push it open uh, with the vessel. And then you deflate the balloon and this remains open and stays behind and then you can remove it. So that, that's how you, so the, the challenge is, you know, if you have a, a very severe blockage, you know, can you get it across there? And oftentimes there's calcification and other sorts of disease aspects. Uh, the anatomy isn't, you know, isn't always conducive to a very smooth sorts of procedure. So uh, being able to, at the end of one meter, push something and have that force transfer all the way over to very precisely position it, you know, somewhere that you can't really even see where you are is kind of the, the trick and why cardiologists get paid so much money. Uh, so the, the second uh, big factor is the push for these combination devices. So I talked a little bit about how when you open up uh, the blood vessel, you end up doing some damage to the wall and you end up, you know, create a scar tissue uh, formation. So what has, you know, now become standard of care is what's known as drug eluding stents. So what people did is they you know, took some of the pharmaceuticals <laughs> that were being used for oncology or other sorts of indication and said, hey, these are really good at stopping tumors to grow. You know, can we put these onto a stent and then use that to kind of influence this uh, wound healing, scar forming uh, response? Uh, so a, a drug eluding stent basically has you know, four different uh, portions. It has your delivery system or catheter and your stent, which is the same as before. Uh, you also have your uh, API or your pharmaceutical uh, that uh, gives the, uh, basically prevents the, the restenosis uh, from forming the antiproliferative. But you also have, you need to have a coating because if you just put the drug onto the stent and try to get it into there, that the, the drug will come off right away or peel off. So you don't necessarily have controlled delivery. So that, the rate at which you deliver this to the tissue is very important, and in order to do that, you need to have a good coating uh, to deliver it. Uh, so this is uh, some data from different uh, trials that basically show uh, that you know the, the restenosis or the T TLR, which stands for the uh, target lesion revascularization. So that's basically when you open up a blood vessel, if it closes off and you have to go back and reopen it again, uh, the, the percentage of, of which this happens uh, with drug eluding stents has uh, improved. So with uh, balloon angioplasty, you had about 30% uh, of the time, you would have to go back and retreat that same blood vessel. So you'd have here of people who would constantly be going in to get their uh, blood vessels ballooned because they kept closing them down. With stents, it helped a little bit. Uh, it's around 12% uh, or so of the patients. Uh, so when you, get a, when you do get a stent, bare metal stent, uh, Traditionally, it, had, it was about 88% of the time you were, you were fine. Uh, with uh, these drug eluding stents, uh, those for the one year uh, time frame are anywhere from 4% to 6%. And this is old data, so there's, there's also procedural advances. So I think the you know, current generations are even improved upon, upon these. And uh, the challenge with this is that the drug worked pretty well, but in some cases it worked too well. So you balance out trying to have uh, this healing response uh, with inflammation. So when, when you don't have uh, your tissue grow around the stent, your stent is still uh, present and poking out in the blood vessel. And this can create activation for some of the blood and other inflammatory cells. So this polymer is kind of a chronic uh, inflammatory creator. Uh, so that the challenge is uh, with the bare metal stent, if you, if you think of how much you know, tissue growth it's always a histogram how much tissue growth uh, was able to be moved back uh, with the presence of the drug. But the challenge is that some of it actually had negative 
uh, growth. So the, the, the blood vessel would actually try to, you know, grow away from uh, the polymer uh, there. So that was, you know, what was one of the, one of the challenges is trying to balance out, uh, they, they call it late loss. So how much of the blood vessel, uh, w when you open up the blood vessel, how wide is it? And then when you come back at one year, does it get wider or does it get smaller? And you want it to basically stay about the same, maybe get a little bit more narrow so that you can be sure that none of your patients have uh, that growing out. So that's kind of a, a little bit of a complicated sort of concept, but the, the idea is if you hear of this late stent thrombosis or, or other sorts of things, that, that's where the, the problem comes from, is the, the part of the, uh, the stent that doesn't get covered up uh, by the tissue. Uh, so people are on aspirin and other sort of antiplatelets for a very long period of time because they want to make sure that they give enough time for the, the stent to be fully covered before going off that. Yeah, yeah there is the coverage of the tissue and plus, uh, after that there is also the cholesterol or whatever that in fact can, can make plaques or whatever around it. Is there any uh, drug which goes with it so that uh, it would uh, basically not the build up of the... So, so to try to dissolve away yeah, the plaque or the... Yeah. So uh, none of the current commercial devices are, are targeting that. A lot of times, you know, some of the Lipitor and other statins need to be processed by the liver in order for them to be effective. Yeah. So it would be a completely new pharmaceutical entity. And one of the challenges I think is, you know, if, if you think of who, who you need or what sort of skill set you need to make a stent and a catheter, it's basically mechanical engineers and polymer chemists and, you know, uh, material scientists. You don't necessarily need biologists or, you know, people who would be from Genentech or from you know, like a, a pharma, big pharma type uh, company. So it's almost, you know, we have different sorts of languages. Even the FDA has completely different uh, regulatory paths for a drug versus a, a medical device. So because of, you know, some of those regulatory and other sorts of complications, I don't think we've fully explored the opportunities to where they could be. But for, for the, you know, right now, the, the drug eluding stents are really targeting the restenosis or the tissue proliferation uh, following it, rather than trying to stop the, the plaque from depositing itself. Uh, so this is a, a complicated slide that you can't read, so I'll just kind of say that, you know, as we go forward, you know, with uh, a lot of the first generation drug eluting stents, healing or taking care of a, a lot of the, the problems that bare metal stents had, you have to go to more and more complex patients in order to demonstrate uh, that your product is good. So you may have a really good product uh, and you may you know, reduce the complication from 4% down to 3%, but in order to demonstrate that, it may take 10, a 10,000 patient trial and 30 or $300 million to do that you know, study. So the question is, you know, how, how big are these changes that need to be in order to make uh, the investment in order for it to go? And I, I think as you go to more complex patients, you have more heterogeneity in terms of the response, but the, the outcomes are probably better at demonstrating the, the improvements as uh, the uh, technology continues to improve. Uh, here's where you, know, you talked about for neurological uh, disorders, what are the different areas? So you know, spasticity, uh, chronic pain, and Parkinson's are what we, we talked about before, but overactive bladder is another uh, area. Also, even obesity is one that they I've talked about, so the vagus nerve is something that if you can stimulate that, uh, creates a satiety sort of feeling, and you know, that may be a way to kind of be a, a you know, alternative to gastric bypass surgery. Uh, so far, you know, the initial trials of there haven't quite panned out the, the exact way. It takes a lot more energy to stop you from eating than it does to, to do some of that, so that you know, the, there are some you know, different technical challenges with that, but there's kind of examples of where uh, different things are going. And then in terms of you know, some of the other miniaturization, if you think of you know, spine surgery and what you know, people talk about spine surgery from the 1800s, you know, it was always like a barbaric sort of thing where you know, kind of like a guy with a hood and you know, come in with a big knife. Uh, now it's, it's very you know, uh, customized. They can go from the front side or back uh, depending on kind of where the, the patient is. Uh, and both you know, herniated discs, spinal fractures, and then you know, just overall degeneration from diseases uh, can be treated. And we also have what's called infuse, which is uh, a bone morphogenic protein to stimulate a bone growth. So that's something that you know, not only do you mechanically fix the bone, 
but you then also provide something that allows you to regrow the bone around it. Uh, for communication and network with uh, our drug eluding stents, we don't really talk to them. So this is definitely something that, you know, our company does it, but it's outside of our, our business unit. Uh, and our cardiac rhythm uh, management is one that, you know, is probably most on the, the frontier of this. They have what's called a care link monitor and a couple other companies have similar sorts of things. But basically, the physician can read all your different vital signs uh, remotely because, you know, you just have to walk near uh, this monitor once a day and then that uploads your data to the system. So if something is drifting or trending differently or if your lead detaches and you're not quite getting the same signal or if the battery is starting to run out, this can go directly uh, to your physician. Uh, similarly, so you know what, right? I mean, how is the information now coming to the device itself? So the, so the device has an RF communicator, so it, it basically talks to this care link module. So you have to either like put it on your chest for you know 30 seconds or maybe walk close enough to it, and then that's networked. So to basically, you might get the information on the RF and say, and what is the range of that frequency if it is, uh, you know, I mean, if you can, you can share it with us. No, what frequency is it at? Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I, I know that it's, I mean, it's available. I mean, people have talked, because I think there was like one concern a while back about people hacking into medical devices yeah, or yeah. something like that. And, you know, that kind of the, what the outcome was is that's the same thing as shooting someone with a gun at some level. You know, if you're going to try to hurt someone, there's many ways to do it. So, you know, from a, you know, what we think of as a business risk, we don't think of that as like a legitimate one. But I, I know there was talk about what bandwidth and other sorts of things they were doing and you know, some of the RF sorts of things. Because you can you know, both not only monitor how well it's doing, but then also change uh, the program at which level you're supposed to start pacing or which level you're supposed to give, administer a shock or other things. That's good if you, if you pass through the blood sample or whatever and it's going to attenuate quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know what the, the, the range is. Uh, I mean, it's not miles, but it, it's probably, you know, a couple feet or so. Uh, so diabetes is a, another, you know, very large unmet need. You know, 250 million diabetics worldwide and, you know, definitely increasing. So the, kind of the, the holy grail of this is to get a continuous feedback a glucose monitor. So as your, you know, uh, glucose comes up, it automatically delivers insulin. Right now there's, you know, there's insulin pumps that can deliver insulin in a very controlled area. There's implantable sensors that can give, you know, prolonged reading of what your uh, glucose levels are without the need to constantly prick your finger. Uh, and now they're working at trying to, to match those up. And I don't know why it's taking so long. It, they talked about it, you know, eight years ago as being kind of the next big thing. Maybe I'll come back in eight years and tell you it's almost ready. Uh, but it, it is, you know, a very complicated that sort of thing, but another area of where you have different devices communicating with each other. Uh, the fourth large driver is uh, the, the drive for the low cost and high reliability. So, you know, all, all of these medical devices are providing benefits by, you know, new and newer and newer technologies. So this is, you know, for a little extra, your pacemakers will access Twitter. Kind of the challenge though is, there's not a lot of wiggle room for reliability. You can't just, you know, hit the reboot button uh, and say, okay, you know, we'll try again. I, you know, so these have to work not just 99% of the time, but, you know, 100% of the time if that's even possible. So I think, you know, reliability is very key. And if you look at, you know, the different jobs within the industry, more and more of them are for, you know, Six Sigma and, you know, quality engineers and other sorts of aspects. So, every, you know, the design is kind of neat, but really the, the, the expertise is in making it reproducible and reliable every time. And we have this uh, kind of target of where, you know, we were every five seconds a Medtronic device was being implanted in someone and changing kind of their, their life. And just recently we were all very excited about having it now every four seconds someone gets a Medtronic device. And to me, this is a very scary number because this means that every four seconds someone else depends on your devices being reliable to maintain their health going forward. So it just kind of helps drive home kind of the message of, you know, how important it is to, to you know, sure you're helping people, but it, it makes, you know, you need to do the best job you can every time. And this is an example of something that, you know, people don't always think of in terms of reliability, but even like, you know, packaging and it improving uh, the, the package in terms of both low cost and being able to be, you know, functional. 
uh, a, a lot of you know testing goes into shelf life and stability and if you can you know have something that lasts for 18 months as opposed to needs to be replaced every three months uh, that that's that's a huge uh, benefit uh, both for the you know customer and you know the patient just from an overall cost savings because cost is definitely going to be you know something that is a consideration going forward uh, the next one is the regulatory environment and since this is kind of a you know, frustrating sort of area for a lot of times. I, I thought I'd give this, hopefully this isn't what my lecture is. Uh, so, but basically, you know, Dean's personality being classified as a drug uh, may cause drowsiness. Uh, but kind of the, I, I really think that the FDA has a really hard job if you, if you think about it. There's never a time when they're in the, the press for doing a good job. Uh, only bad things can happen if they approve something that shouldn't be approved and then when they don't approve something, Everyone yells at them for how slow they are and how they're holding up technology. But it definitely has been, over the years, becoming harder and harder to uh, get things through. And you know, as an example, we're on our third generation of drug eluting stent, and each time it becomes more expensive in a longer timeline than the one before. So it's not, I mean, as we learn more, we learn how to, to do things slower and more complicated. And it's not just you know, the regulatory environment. I think you know, there's a, a Increased level of you know quality also in terms of you know reimbursement you know with healthcare uh, being where it is you have to demonstrate not only you're being a benefit to the patient but a benefit in a cost effective sort of way. Uh, there, there's a you know big push for uh, transparency uh, in terms of how you work with physicians. So a lot of times the new technologies come from you know combining an idea that a physician has with an idea that an engineer has and coming up with a solution together. Uh, now, you know, because that, that's a very valuable tool, there's also a, a push that you don't want to pay your physicians to be using your product, and there's, you know, accusations that, you know, what constitutes valid R&D development versus, you know, kind of promotion for you using our, our products. And there's definitely, you know, people, a, a wide gray area and people who are on the wrong sides of each uh, but, but I think it just kind of goes to, you know, where we are, are going. And hospitals are starting to, you know, bundle purchases together and, you know, more aggressive in terms of uh, regulatory environments. And there's just a lot of different macro trends that also beyond just, you know, having a good product and a good manufacturing process are going to impact uh, what goes on. Uh, and then lastly, I'll, I'll finish up uh, with a little bit about uh, globalization. So I think this is kind of a, a an, interesting sort of concept. So you can see that, you know, within the United States, uh, we have a, a number of, of different locations. Probably 15 years ago, 80% or 90% of us were located in Minneapolis, and I guess it got too cold, so they moved to a bunch of different places. Uh, a while back, you know, a friend told me that, you know, if someone asks you a really hard question and you can't think of what the answer is, just tell them China, because that's probably the answer <laughs> to most of the really hard questions that you can't answer. And in our you know, case, you know, that's really where we're, we're looking towards. You know, you know, Europe and Japan and Canada are all you know, very important. You can see that you know, the growth is you know, decent in, the, in those areas, but really it's the emerging markets like China, uh, Latin America, if you look at Brazil, uh, you know, there's, there's very large uh, sorts of opportunities there, not just in terms of you know, who we're currently treating, but if you look at you know, kind of the economic pyramid and the people who aren't being treated, I think you know, the, the real need going forward to really kind of provide a benefit to society is to try to target uh, everyone. So as, as kind of the communicable diseases start to uh, get caught up and wiped out, you know, so malaria isn't what is causing people uh, to die in an emerging uh, market, it then starts to become chronic diseases and more and more people will have heart disease or diabetes or other things and they'll want to, you know, they don't want to die of heart disease just like we don't. So I think if we can find a way to try to target people in a cost-effective sort of way, that's a huge opportunity, not just for our company, but for anyone out there who has ideas in that. So I started out with you know, kind of these sorts of 15-year cycles of you know, what is next. So for us, we're looking to diversify into a lot of different areas. So if you think of our customers and what their expertise is, it's basically being able to do very sophisticated surgeries with you know, a very small footprint in terms of uh, going, into the, going into the body. So heart valve repair uh, over here, you can see that you know, instead of having an uh, open chest heart valve, you can now uh, insert a catheter and uh, 
deploy a heart valve so someone who may not be eligible for uh, open surgery can now get this. Uh, so people who are 80, 90 years old uh, can now get uh, new heart valves. Other ones, abdominal aneurysms. So as, you know, pe especially people who smoke or uh, have other sorts of uh, predispositions, sometimes their uh, abdominal aorta starts to balloon out. And th in the past, what they would do is they would open it up, you know, cut out a section, sew it back up so that it was smaller. Uh, now they can place a, a new stent sleeve inside of it and be able to reduce the pressure from the wall and stop that from growing. And if you can get it down to the point where you can do it minimally invasive, right now it's a hybrid between a surgical procedure and a minimally invasive. And you know, the idea is to get it to be a truly minimally invasive procedure. Interventional hypertension is probably where we think is you know, the most uh, opportunity. If you think of how many people have hypertension and kind of the effects of you know, uh, stroke and other sorts of indications, uh, they found that a lot of that takes place, a lot of people take meds and other sorts of things for hypertension, but that causes overstimulation of your kidneys uh, with your sympathetic nerves. Uh, so basically by trying to cut off that signal with RF ablation, you can have a 20 millimeter or 30 millimeter drop in uh, blood pressure. Uh, erectile dysfunction, that's also a very vascularized disease, so that's another bid uh, that people are, are looking at. So you know, a lot of people are non-responders to uh, traditional medicine, so that's something that uh, we're looking at. And then, you know, we talked about miniaturization. If you think now, instead of having a can with a lead uh, for uh, pacing, if you just have a leadless pacemaker that gets implanted directly into the heart, uh, this can now be miniaturized down to the size of like a large pill, well, a very large pill, but you know, something that is much smaller than uh, any of the current sorts of areas. And this is, you know, relieves the complexity of the surgery and then also provides benefit uh, as well. And if you look at, you know, kind of across the board, this is, uh, those were just for our, our vascular department. There's opportunities across all areas. So I, I think, you know, the technologies can definitely provide more value as, as we go forward. The challenge is balancing out those other driving factors like the regulatory and cost uh, drivers uh, to provide benefit to the patient. So with that, uh, thank you and I'll be happy to answer any questions. So, so there's, there's a number of, of different areas. I mentioned before that you know, with our devices being largely mechanical in how they, they function, it may not be as much as with the neuro or the diabetes or the CRDM group, which basically have a lot of different you know, systems and electrical you know, aspects associated with the device. But we, we manufacture all of our own devices and each of these new manufacturing processes takes uh, custom equipment. So a lot of what we do in R&D is the process development and figuring out ways to, to manufacture that. So, uh, you know, we do, we do a lot of, you know, design, but also uh, work with some, you know, electrical engineers in our equipment side of things. So that's just, you know, one example. I think if you then move into some of these other devices that do have more of an electrical basis in terms of how they function, then it definitely starts to broaden out. And how simulation that bit? So, so we do we do some simulation. I, I think you know a lot of it is a finite element analysis or computational fluid dynamics or you know things along those lines. Uh, you know so so that's to, to me I think that's like a standard skill set that double E's may have or mechanical engineers or chemical engineers may have. Uh, but it, I mean I, I think from where where we look when we hire people is you know sometimes we'll have a very specific problem that we need a very sp you know person with a a skill set or someone who has done experience in an area before, but a lot of what we look for is, you know, people who can come in and contribute to teams and be good problem solvers and, you know, be able to function in a lot of different areas because the problem today, six months from now is, you know, old news and if that's, if that's all you do, you know, that, that's not going to be great for, for the long term. So I think the people who can really succeed are the, the ones who can use their scientific principles and apply them to a range of different problems. And then when the, uh, when the engineers come, uh, let's say, for employment to, to Medtronic, uh, how much do you uh, look for the uh, um, biology type of uh, mm -hmm. uh, knowledge in the, in the person? 
So ag again, it depends a little bit on, every once in a while we'll look to, to have biology, but uh, a lot of our products are still functioning through traditional mechanical and other sorts of interactions. So to de develop and design the device doesn't necessarily take a biologic background. What's important is to be able to speak with the biology because a lot of the analysis ends up being with animal studies and using histology as endpoints and biocompatibility. And you know, if you can't figure out what are the right questions or how to interpret the data, then it becomes a, a challenge. But in terms of actually you know, creating or doing the work, it's not that you're expected to be you know, able to do biology and splice the gene and create a you know, new lamb out of an old lamb or something or whatever they do. Uh, just a couple questions, actually. The first was, um, do you guys do, you probably do a lot of statistical analysis. You're talking mm -hmm. about quality engineering, right? You, like six, six, six Sigma and mm -hmm. all that. Yeah. And the other, the other question was, um, basically, what was your U.S. market growth? You showed Canada and all yeah, that. I don't know. Uh, so it's probably low. That's why they didn't show it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Interesting. So, like, our, our overall growth is 13%, right? So if you right. think of, you know, the mix, wow. Europe is probably the, the large, you know, pr pretty large. Uh, so so I, I think uh, in general we are, you know, about five to six percent. It depends a lot on the different business unit. So something like, you know, our, our stents are growing pretty quickly. The, inter or the implantable cardiac defibrillators are pretty static. So that may be a, you know, three, two to three percent. I think spine actually decreased last year. Okay. Diabetes had a big growth. So, so that, that's the other, you know, so they try to diversify across geographies, but also across different product lines. So as one is kind of getting rapidly adopted, the other, the others, that can, you know, pay the bills to do the development for, right. for the other one. Okay. Uh, re with regard to statistics, I do yeah. agree. I, I'm not, statistics isn't my personal strongest yeah. uh, skill set, but I, I think that's probably the class that I wish I went back and spent the most time uh, understanding. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I do it largely with uh, designs of experiments and trying to understand uh, what, what are the different main factors or main attributes to be looking at. Okay. Uh, since I, I work largely in the early stage R&D, a, a lot of this is very expensive sort of right. work, so we don't necessarily try to prove statistical significance. We try to, you know, prove to ourselves that this is the right direction to be going in. Okay. Uh, but the quality, you know, systems, and especially when you start to get into robust design and capability and other sorts of things, you know, being able to have this statistical background to integrate that into the project, I, I think will, you know, be very important. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Like kind of a follow-on mm -hmm. to that. Then um, I guess it seems like maybe EEs could could be, become quality engineers. Then assuming they had a like a statistical background, or it's kind of seems like kind of agnostic to like the field of engineering. Yeah, so I mean, to, to me, the, the things that make good quality engineers are the, the very good attention to detail uh -huh. and being able, to, you know, very process-based and refine things into something that is, you know, able to be scaled. Okay. So it's, it's I, I think it's less, uh, you know, I think you definitely draw on, you know, your specific expertise or domain expertise with double E or, you know, mechanical engineering or other, other aspects. But you know, it's it's a little bit also the type of person who you know excels in that sort of area okay. as well. Thank you. Is there a question in the back? No. Uh, how about the uh, uh, valves uh, for the, I mean the heart valves mm -hmm. and the aortic valve and so on? Uh, basically, uh, the procedure it seems that uh, one needs to go and then cut the uh, existing valve and then now put. No, so what they what they do is they some, sometimes they'll do what's called a valvioplasty. So what what happens is the these valves uh, start to get calcified. So you, you're you know you have like your, your your three valves and they'll you know would open up into something like this. And as they start to get calcified, they no longer flex, and then you get a smaller and smaller hole, and eventually you have insufficient blood flow from going back. So the the first attempt to do this minimally invasively would be to just take a balloon and go in here and try to, you know, push these open so that, you know, basically, you know, crack the eggshell or whatever that's in there to, so that it can, and it works for about six months and then it goes back to how it was. So what they do now with these uh, uh, transcatheter valves is they basically will take, take the, the stent and if you look at the, you know, the cross section, you know, your, your valve may be here 
they'll take the stent and they'll just place it all the way over the valve. Uh, so, so these do have some, you know, t tissue valves so that, you know, porcine or other sort of valves that are commonly used in surgical uh, tissue valves. Uh, and those are sewn on to uh, these, these stent devices. And then they basically go and cover the whole annulus of where the, the old valve used to be and basically replace that. Let's uh, thank Dr. Uh, Breitman who gave us really such an interesting and informative talk and I really enjoyed it. So let's give it a